Good morning. Um, I'm Nancy Wing, one of the librarians here at the National Archives, and here to welcome you today. And we are so pleased that you have expressed an interest in the Know Your Records program. Uh, know Your Records was designed to inform the staff, the volunteers, researchers, and the general public on the records of the National Archives and how they can aid in historical research. We offer not only the weekly lecture series, but also genealogy workshops, symposia, the annual genealogy fair, a book discussion group, and a researcher newsletter. If you would like more information, contact the um, KYR information that you have in your program there. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing about the history of the National Archives and uh, from the War Department fire in 1800 to the establishment of the National Archives in 1934. Archivist Constance Potter looks at why some records did not survive and how others just made it to the National Archives. Her focus is on records of genealogical interest. Constance Potter is a reference archivist at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., specializing in federal records of interest to genealogists. She worked on the release of the 1920 and 1930 censuses and is a regular speaker at the Federation of Genealogical Societies, the National Genealogical Society, the National Institute on Genealogical Research, as well as local genealogical groups in Virginia and Maryland. Today's program will be what, just less than an hour long, I believe, and we certainly hope you enjoy it. Please help me uh, uh, welcome Connie to us here. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. And thank you for your patience. How many of you have worked in reference? And you know the person that looks at you and their eyes are pleading and they say, but that record has to exist. And you say, no, it doesn't. And now I'm giving you some more ammunition as to how you can nicely tell them, no, it does not exist. Uh, the, um, this is more history of records in the archives, and it's divided into two periods, uh, 1776 to 1926, and then 1931 to about 1934. Okay. In the Declaration of Independence, I think this is item number 13, they wrote, he, that's King George III, has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, um, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. So as early as 1776, uh, the people who were going to start the federal government were interested in the whole issue of what was going to happen to federal records. There were a series of fires. The worst was, no, well, the first and a very bad one was November 8th, 1800. The War Department had moved into a townhouse in Funkstown. Who knows what Funkstown is now called? It's Foggy Bottom. It went from one really good name to another really good name. Okay. They're not quite sure how the fire started. Uh, there's a wonderful article in Prologue by uh, Howard Wayman about the origins of the fire. Someone who was in the building next to the um, War Department, there was a, a memorial, not a memorial service, a wake that day. And they think it might have been because people were partying, but they don't know for sure. Anyway, there was a fire that started, and everyone ran through the buildings, opening all the windows. Not a good idea. So lots and lots of things burned, including uh, registers and stub books, courts marshals, information on pension files. If you look at the pension files on microfilm, some of them you'll see there's just one page. It will have the name, the state, and at the bottom is a, a lot of text. And the gist of this text is these records were destroyed 
by the fire in the War Department in 1800. So even if you know somebody had a pension in 1798 um, or 99, it was probably destroyed in the, in the War Department fire. They also destroyed the records of the Board of War. So for years, the War Department had no official records. They looked at records from the Department of State, the Department of the Interior, Treasury. But late in the 19th century, they began collecting records. And as you know, federal records are generally not a collection. But this is one record group that is a collection of records. Uh, they got a lot of records from Timothy Pickering, from the quartermaster office. Uh, and when these records were consolidated, brought together, Fred C. Ainsworth, who started the compiled military system, and is a great person to study if you want to build a bureaucratic empire, because this man knew how to do it. He used the records collected in, in uh, Record Group 93 to start the uh, compiled service records. And these records included muster rolls, payrolls, and other records relating to military service. Now, not all of the records uh, survive. So if you look in um, Washington's Crossing by David Hackett Fisher, in the back it gives the order of battle. And in some cases, uh, for example, St. Clair, they simply say, we don't, ha we, we don't have the records. They no longer exist. Okay. So there were lots of fires. Uh, again, War Department fire in 1801, one of many fires in the Department of the Treasury. One of the people who helped put out the fire was the president. John Adams had just moved into the White House. He heard about the fire. He grabbed a bucket and helped put out, tried to help put out the fire. In 1814, the British, as you know, burned Washington in the War of 1812. And one of the places you can read about what they did to the records is the first annual report of the Archivist of the United States. And I want to here give a plug for early annual reports. 19th, early 20th century annual reports are narrative. They tell a story. You can find out about a tornado in Georgia, and it describes what happened on, on particular farms. You can get a good history of your agency. You can find out about the Army Corps of Engineers doing construction on rivers in Florida. It's not what it is now, a nice little PR piece. But, um, so go see Jeff Hartley in the library and ask to see early annual reports, because they're great. What? They, so they describe it. Say the British, they carried away the records, they destroyed the records, and worse of all, they disarranged the records. In 1851, there was a fire at the Library of Congress that destroyed a lot of Thomas Jefferson's collection that had, was the foundation of the library. In 1877, the top floor of the patent office burned, and we think that the Declaration of Independence may have been there at that time. 1911, the Coast and Geodetic Survey. But two that really continue to affect us today are the Commerce uh, Fire in 1921 that damaged the 1890 census. Now, that census wasn't destroyed until 19 until the 1930s. And at that time, the, the appraisal process, it would go through the Librarian of Congress, and he would look at what was considered useless papers. He said these are useless papers, destroyed them, and that was about the same week we laid the cornerstone to the National Archives building. And a lot of people, people that you probably know, are still affected by the 1973 fire in St. Louis, Missouri, that destroyed the World War I and World War II Army and some of the Air Force records. But even recently, although it was not primarily a fire, think of Katrina that destroyed um, local, state, and federal records in Louisiana and Mississippi. So fires and natural disasters are always a problem. How many of you recognize this gentleman? If you go into Archives One, you're going to see his picture as you, as you come into the archives. This is J. Franklin Jameson. Okay. Although um, I talk about the destruction of records, 
The art, uh, they were also, the government was creating a lot of records, and the numbers I'm giving here, I'm not sure where they got these numbers, but in 1860, it was estimated that the government had about 180,000 cubic feet of records. By the time it got to 1916, before the US entry into World War I, it was about a million cubic feet of records. And people constantly were trying to put bills before Congress. Between 1881 and 1912 alone, there were 30, uh, 42 bills to establish a national archives. In 1913, J. Franklin Jameson, who was the president of the Histor American Historical Association, almost, almost got an archives bill. Then there came the war in Europe, the United States in 1917, and that ended the the uh, movement on at that time. Okay. This is the Central Market at 7th and Pennsylvania. It was built, well, it still is, on the Tiber River and the Canal. It was so marshy that sometimes they called this the Marsh Market. Until 1850, there were slave pens on this site. So when the president got out at the corner of 7th and Pennsylvania during the inauguration, um, I, I think he knew what, what he was doing when he got out of the car there. Um, in 1923, 24, and 25, Coolidge recommended an archives in, the, in, the, in his budget message. And as late as 1926, the United States was the only um, country well, Europe, all European countries had archives, 12 Latin American countries had archives, but the United States didn't. And so on July 3rd, 1926, Congress approved the second Deficiency Act that provided for $7 million to build an archives. And then they later increased that to, to $8 million. Now the other, the first part is the discussion of a national archives. I'm not going to talk about the national archives. Okay. This looks, well, this looks like someone laying a cornerstone. It is. It's Hoover. Rick Blondow, however, told me, look at it closely. This is February 20th, 1933. And in March, FDR, who was a member of the Society of American Archivists, was about to become president. Hoover wanted to be the one to lay the cornerstone for the archives. If you look closely, there's no building there. It's just on a, on a wooden platform. So this was um, an honorary ceremonial laying of the cornerstone and they had to put it in later. These, these two guys, I don't know how heavy that thing is, but they're holding on to that for dear life. And inside the cornerstone is a Bible, a copy of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the American flag, public acts authorizing the construction of the building and other, other things. But it wasn't until June 19, 1934 that Congress finally provided the, uh, the funding to staff the archives building in an act to establish a national archives of the United States government and for other purposes and the act provided for all archival records belonging to the government to be under the charge of the archivist. And this, the first archivist of the United States was Robert D.W. Connor of the University of North Carolina. And most of the early staff, in fact, all four of them, were historians. They weren't archivists. For a while, the archives was in justice across the street. By the time they moved into the building, there, um, we had a staff of, of 80. So we had the building, we had the staff, but what was it going to hold? Although the archivist had the power to go out and get the records, he wasn't going to go all around and look for all the records. So who would locate the records and who would decide if they were permanent or temporary? Okay. So we're going to look at where they found some of the records. This is a good picture. This is in the garage of the White House. It's War Department records. You can see 
Um, yeah, just a little dot. There's the ramp going down. Uh, there's some metal bars here. This is wood, and things are, um, yeah, well, we do. This is also the White House garage. Uh, this, you, this is hard to see, but there's a door here that's ajar. And what can come in through doors? Mice, little other animals. Here's a bare light bulb. That's always good. A tire. This is the garage floor, so you've got the cars with exhaust, oil spills. Um, yeah. Uh, and here we have wooden bookcases. Just note this one little piece of paper right here. Okay, this is August, about August 3rd, 1935, and the following picture was taken four days later. Whoa. There's that same little piece of paper. <laughs> In one lecture I gave, someone asked me what that piece of paper was. I don't know. The people who looked at the records in Washington, D.C., were called um, deputy examiners. And the WPA hired people to look at the records uh, throughout the, the, um, the country. They found records in basements, attics, carriage houses, abandoned buildings, any place they could, they could um, put a record, they found it. And in the early days, of, uh, when I say the 1820s, 1830s, they complained that if you walked into the Department of Treasury, the records were just piled here. And so you might have a tour group going through, and they'd look and say, oh, well, yeah, that, okay, that looks interesting, and they'd walk off with it. But I mean, there's no law against it. Um, so things disappeared. You never knew what. You never knew when. You never knew how. After opening file cabinets or something like this, they would uh, complete a form, and it'd give you the quantity of records, the arrangements, dates, and the research values of the uh, records. And this is what a survey ro uh, worker wrote in the Midwest. We then asked the custodian to show us this room. He shuddered at the thought of enter entering the dungeon. He warned us that we would be subject to possible attack by the many rats that make their home in these quarters. Local hordes of silverfish have feasted on the bindings of these books for so long that there are practically no records securely bound. It is rather disheartening to spend time shoveling dust and plaster off from the upper, upper part of a container and find that the bottom contains records that are so moldy that it is almost impossible to separate the pages. Um, in one point, this is in, I think it's in, these are records, whoops, from Galveston. And in fact, this is a perfect example. So they're walking down the, down the staircase and there's garbage. And they see something lying there on the floor. It's trash, it's gonna be thrown away and they look at it. It is slave manifests from Galveston to New Orleans, 1836 to 1838. Had somebody not walked down and seen this thing lying on the floor, those records would have been lost forever. So they picked it up and kept it. The WPA, um, excuse me, the deputy examiners found more than 6,500 depositories or rooms in the Washington area and about 3 million cubic feet of record. 43% of those records they brought to the archives. And most of the agencies gave up their records because they simply didn't have the space. The WPA survey found four million feet of cubic uh, records, most of them in post office and customs houses. Um, so after they brought them into the archives, well, here's some post office records. And this, this is a little hard to see, but see the volume right here? This huge volume, and here's the binding, and it's working on that canvas bag, paper wrapping. This is the Civil Service Commission. Um, fairly good storage here, but wooden boxes here. And I don't know if these are heat pipes or water pipes, but they still water humidity, not good. This is the Civil Service Commission, a little bit of red tape. 
But you can see how things in, are bound in twine, just stuffed into corners. Okay. These are the records arriving at the National Archives. For those of you who were here when we moved from downtown to here, remember the Mayflower buses? I mean, buses, trucks going on and on. So. And here they're arriving at the, that's great. Uh, you know what I just realized? You can see there's no Federal Trade Commission. Here they are in the loading dock. Okay. Here they are taking them out of the, the trucks. And here are the woodruff boxes, which of course are wooden, high acid, open, dust and stuff get down, tri-folded, as the conservatives say, degradation in two places. And it's smooshed together with metal. I mean, there's nothing good about a, a Woodruff box, but they were still using them when I when I got here. Okay. Here they're defumigating them, and I just years ago I was called into the central research room on a Saturday because one of our researchers had come down with yellow fever from the Spanish American War records. She also went for those of you who remember Mr. Uh, Jim McGronigal, She went into his office to complain, so her research card was revoked. So. She had other issues. <laughs> she was so busy being the Queen of England and Norway, however, that she couldn't contest the removal of a researcher's card. And here they're fumigating them some more. Here they're laminating, which we wouldn't do now. And this next one, I love this picture. He, um, he's ironing the records flat. Uh, my husband, who used to work here, says that this, this thing used to be up in something like 18E whatever, uh, and I'm afraid maybe it got lost during the renovation. In 1952, the records were transferred to the, uh, a lot of them to the Library of Congress, but to give you some idea of what could happen to the records, the uh, papers of the Continental Congress went from Philadelphia to Baltimore, from Baltimore back to Philadelphia, to Lancaster, Pennsylvania for one day, to York, Pennsylvania, back to Philadelphia, then to Washington, D.C., where they went to the State Department. Then they went to the Library of Congress, and then they came to the National Archives. Um, stuff had to get lost. It just, it just had to. But in 1952, uh, the Library of Congress gave us a lot of the records. And again, I have got to thank Rick Blondo for finding this. This is from the, finding this for me. This is from the annual report, the Librarian of Congress, 1953. And Luther Evans, the librarian, had asked David uh, Mearns, the chief of the manuscript division, to write something for the annual report. He wrote seven pages, but I'm just going to read this briefly. Procrustean logic and the inexorable requirements of the law required the transfer. The retired but retained records of the government must be entrusted to the National Archives. Retired? Retained, they will never retire. They will always be retained, but they must be removed. I feel so sorry for him. But the third annual report of the library, of, excuse me, of the archivist, really sums up what I want you to take away from this lecture. Considering the strange things that happen to public records, it seems miraculous that so many of interest and value are still in existence, and I just want to leave you with this slide from 1985. Yeah. We were with GSA for a while, for those of you who were fairly new to the agency. Um, do you have any questions? This is just sort of an introduction as to why we don't have anything. Um, any, any questions? Well, at least you're all smiling, you know? I mean, Somebody yesterday from Kansas City asked me why they took them 48 hours to get microfilm. I don't know. Yeah. I would think almost when we started doing this, I don't know how formal they were, um, 
but they worked with the agencies. Some agencies wouldn't give us their records. The um, House and Senate and the Supreme Court did not give us their records until after World War II. But when the VA was eager to give them to us, and I th they worked with a lot of the agencies. In fact, many of the early archivists were historians or what we might now call records managers with the agency. So they knew the arrangement and how the records were used. Unfortunately, not all of that was written down. I think the best example is on the inside of the compiled military service records. We don't always know what that means. Lots of problems with customs records. Yeah. So when those people either retired or somehow left the archives of their agency, that information went with them. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. And I guess we're done. Oh, and now? And now the poor people who are trying to get your network back up can now get back in because I had to use her, her thing. Thank you, Connie. Um, please be sure you fill out your evaluation form and leave it on the table that you signed in on out front. And next week we will be uh, meeting in the old uh, lecture room B, where we usually are, and that uh, presentation will be on uh, the archival research catalog. Thank you so much for coming. Where's my mouse?